Good morning. I am Mr. Ish. Thank you for joining me. In this video, we're just examining briefly and swiftly the differences between net change and total change. And you know, this topic is coming about because we've been looking at integrals involving derivatives, or you can say we've been doing integration of rates of change. If you have, and we can always come back to this, if you have an integral, a defined interval, you have within this a derivative which was probably derived from a function, not necessarily, but which came about from a function that went through integration procedure to give you the antiderivative and then this antiderivative went through a derivative procedure to give back the derivative of this antiderivative which technically here f of x would be equal to this, the derivative of the antiderivative. Anyhow, when you're running this derivative through this defined integration procedure you're doing of a rate of change and what you end up getting over here if you look at this sentence over here or this expression you're saying that the integration defined integration of a derivative is equal to the upper limit minus the lower limit or you can say here the final position minus the initial position and position here is not talking about in terms of position or distance or displacement the position I'm talking about the final state or the initial state and you can also reword this entire thing as the final state of a system is always equal to the initial state of that system plus the integral of its derivative because all you've done over here is take this expression and you saw for f of b which is the final position this right here is my initial position and this expression can always be used and this initial expression can always be used to help you understand what the concept of net change is. Net change is that which takes into account the differences between the final state and the initial state and the procedure or the processes that went in between. In this video, we're just looking in an easy manner what the difference is between the net change and the total change. With regards to position, net change can be more applicable with or easily explained in terms of displacement. Displacement is what the net effect is. You could go several units in this direction, several units in this direction where you end up, that's your net. Or you can end, end up going in a circular manner and end up exactly where you started, in which case you have no net movement. What about the total change? The total change over here represents exactly what happened from start to end. It doesn't matter what the direction was, but the total movement or the total effect on that system, that right there is your total change. The easiest way to differentiate between the net change and the total change is by means of a graph. And the reason being is this, if supposedly you graph a parabola which has a appearance such as this, a vertex over here, you know one x-intercept is this zero, another x-intercept is this, let's just say we can call this b comma zero. You know that the net change exists, especially if your interval that you're looking at, and let zero to b be our interval. If the interval you're looking at has some sort of involvement with positive and negative areas. If you're looking at just at zero to b interval, in this case, you're looking at something from zero to b, and if you were to look, you would be looking at this area right here with regards to your x-axis and your curve, only this area. But when you look at this area, everything is here in terms of a negative area, and in this instance, if you were to calculate the area of this, whether it's net change or total change, it'll all be the same. And let's use abbreviations here. The net change will equal to total change because there's no net effect coming about. All the area over here is exactly singularly and just negative. But if we were to change the interval, and let's bring in a letter C over here, C comma zero. If we were to now lo start looking at the interval zero to C, now when you look at zero to c you still have a b included somewhere here in between it falls right in between but when you look at from zero to c now you look at your graph that's why i say the best way to understand the differences between these two is by means of graph but when you look at this in interval entirely from zero to c now you see a negative area and you see a positive area in this instance you know clearly you will have a net change and it will not be the same as the total change. The reason why it won't be the same because you'll have to take the difference between the negative and the positive areas, add them up and that'll represent your net change. But you don't have to do these type of procedures like start worrying about should I add or minus when you're doing an integral procedure, especially with regards to net change where we're talking about displacement. The reason being is because the effect of the interval from zero to C and your curve, let's just call the curve f of x, it automatically captures it. Why does it automatically capture it? Because when you're looking at your curve, you're essentially looking at the same curve, but only from the interval I'm showing it from right here to right here. 
0 to C. The same curve already captures the effect of some part of the curve below the x-axis and some part of the curve above the axis. Hence, when you're doing net change calculations, you just do your integration procedure, the definite integration procedure as you normally would. There's no need for you to start worrying about absolute values. You only worry about absolute values when you're trying to calculate a total change. And when you're looking at total change, then you're looking at all change as being positive. The same graph over here, you would have to adjust it by means of absolute value for that interval where your function is negative or by means of this, a minus outside your function. And that would affect and have the effect such that whatever was negative would become positive. And the same graph would now look something like this. 0, B, C and your everything here with regards to area would now all become positive. You'd have a positive area 1, you'd have a positive area 2 and this would capture very well the total change. The main difference between net change and the total change is exactly what I'm showing you. The net change is just your basic integration, definite integration procedure without regards to worrying about if things are negative or positive. However the curve is with regards to your interval it automatically capture the effects of net changes. The total change requires you to have the special this situation play out where whichever part of the interval, your total interval, whichever part of that sub interval was negative has to be converted into positive. And how you would write this in terms of your integration scheme for this is you do from 0 to b, you can either write as minus f of x dx, then of course you'll add from b to z which was automatically already positive area, you don't have to do any change or you can look at everything as this. From 0 to b, you have f of x, but within absolute value parentheses, plus the remainder of the interval, which is automatically and already positive. The difference between net change and total change is this. This right here is my net change equation. This right here is my total change equation. The net change equation is your ordinary definite integration expression. There's no modification to it. The total change expression requires a modification of this as you see by means of a minus before your function or by means of an absolute value. And you only have to do this in those instances where part of your curve with regards to the interval and by nature of that curve you're having a negative area. If you're not generating any negative area then you don't need to make that modification in that instance the total change and the net change expressions will be the same. For a curve which looks solely like this, hypothetically like this, we don't care about what's on this side because our interval from 0 to let's just say b here you're looking at all of this there's only one area and all happens to be positive here net change is equal to your total change the expressions are the same for another curve which looks something like this as i show you over here in this instance these are just hypothetical curves from 0 to b and we're looking at this area right here here again net change is equal to total change in both instances you'll have a negative area negative area but it doesn't matter these negative areas don't imply in reality that the area is indeed negative it everything is with regards to the model you are looking at if the model here you're looking at is with regards to position displacement and that type of criteria then here the negatives mean you're moving towards the left your initial movement start to the final is always to the left in these instances. In this instance over here, it meant that everything was always only moving towards the left. There was never any right movement, never any net effect. You always have to use graphs to your aids. Those are the procedures or the means by which you'll separate or distinguish between net change and total change. Without doing a graph and arbitrarily doing an indefinite integration procedure, you may wrongfully assume that your answer is a total change when in effect it was a net change or vice versa. We will, in this video, just look at one quick example just to solidify this concept. We have a function here, f of t is equal to t squared minus t minus 6. The best way to make the difference or distinction between a net change and a total change is to graph it, but then you should be thinking about factoring or solving by completing the square techniques. If you just look at that equation or then you were to just factor it, you would have something which would look like t minus 3 and t plus 2 because this would give you that. And you know, you solve for t, you would have... 3 comma minus 2. You could also zero out the t and then you could get a good y intercept of 0 comma minus 6. These would just give you your x intercepts. And then you want to plot in these points. You have 1, 2, 3 comma 0. 
and you have minus two comma zero, you have zero comma minus six, a y-intercept. Now what we have to do is just determine the vertex and solving by completing the square is a technique by which we will do that. T square minus T minus six is equal to zero. We complete the square. T square minus T, we'll have a over two plus one over four minus six plus one over four. We should just put an equal sign here. And then you'll have T minus one over two whole square minus 25 over four is equal to zero. We know the vertex here of this parabola is one over two comma minus 25 over four. You can plot this out half comma minus 25 over four somewhere in the region over here and you could connect these dots. If supposedly for this very function our interval is given as being one to four. Now when we plot this in terms of the interval we're looking at something from right over here one and then we're looking at right over here and then you have to shade accordingly with regards to your curve and your axis of reference. Remember x-axis does not necessarily or the y-axis have to be a reference it could be any horizontal or vertical line but this is what we get. So in this instance you know you have a minus area and a positive area and you know we would do if you did the easy integration just from 1 to 4 for t squared minus t minus 6 dt you would get easily the net change because you're going to integrate this across the interval the curve and the interval will easily capture the negative and the positive area if you wanted to do the the total change you would have to integrate this with regards to two separate intervals one from right here one to three one to three and then from three to four would be your next and then this right here would be your means by which you would capture the total change and we could just easily create an equation for that let's do it right over here for the total change your equation would be such as this from one to three we can just do like a minus over here outside the function t squared minus t minus six dt that would create a positive effect plus then from 3 to 4 we'd have just the basic function t squared minus t minus 6 dt because this basic part right over here already is represented by a positive area. This minus converts the negative area into the positive area and you integrate this over these two intervals and you get your total change. Here you just get your net change. We'll end this video with these few words of caution. At any time you're thinking about net change, total change or you're looking at this net change theorem, you know you're doing a integration procedure, a definite integral of a derivative, you know from an interval lower limit a to upper limit b, you cannot assume that when you're looking at this, don't wrongfully assume that when you're looking at the situation from a to b that there's only a single change occurring. And that change being that your model or your equation or your rate of change is going from a position a to b in a single unidirectional manner because that is not always the case. Perhaps the key word over here is unidirectional because a lot can be happening between A and B and how do you know a lot can be happening between A and B? It is by the relationship between your interval, right? This is just a key fact that you should know between your interval and, and this is the most important part, and your curve. And we'll assume here for all definite purposes the curve is actually a function. You have to clearly examine the relationship between your interval and your curve to know for sure that, that the movement from A to B for your derivative rate of change as, as it goes through this integration, that it is indeed unidirectional or not unidirectional. There could be multiple changes going into A. And let me show you graphically why I bring this up and what I mean. If you're looking at a graph which looks something like this, let's just use an exponential function going from, let's just say from right here A to B. In this instance, when you're looking at this graph and the area below it for this model, it's a single change occurring from A to B because all the area again is positive. But if you're looking at a curve which looks something like this, like a sinusoidal curve, and you're looking here from A up to B, now in this instance you don't have a unidirectional in terms of supposedly this had to do with movement, with position, displacement or distance, you're looking at all of this area which falls between the interval A and B here. In this system you have, or in this example, you have some movement occurring to the right positive area, some moving to the left negative area, and some moving on again to the right positive area. So here you see multiple directional movements occurring within a same interval. Here you see only a single directional movement within a given interval. So don't automatically always assume that just because you have an interval from A to B that only a single event is occurring based on your model, you could have multiple events occurring within that small narrow interval 
and it does not always have to be unidirectional, it could be multidirectional. Alright, these are the little things you need to keep aware of and that's why I'm presenting you this video. Just remember the relationship between your interval and your curve will define exactly what's going on between A and B and that relationship will also help you distinguish between net change, example displacement and total change, example the distance which an object has moved. Thank you for watching, have a nice day.